Can we put the slides on? Hello? Hello, my name is Alon Czekewski. Uh, this is joint work with my thesis advisors, Eyal Ronen and Avisha Wool, on the security of Samsung's Keymaster cryptographic design. We'll start with some background and motivation. Then we'll dive into our security analysis of other protected keys, its impact on higher level protocols with a remote party, and the main lessons that can be learned from our attacks. We use smartphones for a variety of security critical applications. We store sensitive information, we pay with a service like Google Pay, and we manage most of our digital lives on those devices. This makes them a major target for attackers. And in recent years, we saw public attacks that completely compromise the operating system. But we still need to protect the cryptographic keys of applications so that attackers will not be able to transfer money from your bank account or log into a website such as PayPal or Twitter, for instance. For this reason, modern Android devices use ARM Trust Zone for uh, implementing a trusted execution environment, or TEE, that runs a separate, isolated, trust zone operating system in parallel to Android. There are many different trust zone operating systems and trusted applications. Often, they, they are vendor-specific, and their design details and implementations are kept secret. In this research, we chose Samsung, the leading Android, Android vendor, as a test case. We reverse engineered the cryptographic design of its key master, analyzed the security of other protected keys, and the impact on higher level protocols. As we can see, ARM Trust Zone provides a logical separation into two worlds, the normal world, which runs Android, and the secure world, the trans the trusted OS. We follow the Android platform security model that states that the outdoor protection of cryptographic keys should withstand a completely compromised normal world. Finally, the Android key store designed by Google provides cryptographic key management using the Keymaster trusted application in the trust zone. Applications can ask for key generation, and the key master will generate the keys in secure hardware, encrypt it with a, with a hardware protected uh, key, hardware derived key, and will return the, the blobs to the application. The blobs can be stored on disk or, or used for key attestation to prove that the key was generated in secure hardware. The keys can also be used for cryptographic operations, such as encrypt or sign. The important point is that only the key master trusted application should have access to the key material, and the key material should never leave the trust zone. Now let's dive into our security analysis. After extensive reverse engineering, we discovered that Samsung chose to use AES-GCM to protect its key blobs. They use a key derivation function to derive a key from the hardware REK key, with a, a salt parameter, and then use the encryption IV to encrypt the cryptographic key and get a, an encrypted key blob. This is a fragile design. This is, this is the fragile construction, which is not misuse resistant and is highly vulnerable to IV reuse. Two interesting questions are, how are the keys derived and how is the IV chosen? We saw that Samsung uh, used SHA-2 digest for the, for the salt uh, in the key derivation with the following values with three main variations. In the first variation, they use a constant string with attacker-controlled application ID and application data. The second variation on Galaxy S9 also binds the bootloader state, which is constant for our discussion. And only in the third variation did Samsung add 
16 bytes of randomness that change the derived key every time. In the first two variations, the salt is con the, the salt is attacker controlled, so we can have key reuse. To our surprise, we also discovered that, that the Android client can set the encryption IV. This leads to the following IV reuse attack. Given a key blob A that we wish to recover, we can extract the IV, and using the same IV and salt, we can import a known key B into the key store with the key store API, and we get an encrypted key blob B. Now, we can XOR the ciphertext of A with the ciphertext of B to get the XOR of the plain text, and we can XOR with the non plain text of B to fully recover the key A. The first trivial observation is that once we recover the key material, we can use the keys without any restriction. So we can bypass protected confirmation and biometric prompt on Android. And we don't need user consent or presence, and we can just transfer this amount to, to that account from Android without the trusted UI taking over. But this works only on Galaxy S9 and similar devices, and not on the latest Galaxy S10 and newer devices. This is because in the third variation, the salt is randomized, and the derived key changes every time, so we don't have key reuse. To our surprise, we also discovered that the client is allowed to set the encryption version. And <laughs> this allows an attacker to downgrade all new key blobs to a vulnerable encryption version, and then use the IV reuse attack we just saw to fully recover any key. Now let's see how we can use this to break higher level protocols. We'll start when, with an informal introduction, an informal description of the FIDO2 web authentication standard, which is used for passwordless authentication and as a, sec as, and as a sec second factor for the usual password-based login. Web authentication uses a secure, uh, secure element to generate and use authentication keys. Usually, this secure element is an external security key, but we already have an internal secure hardware, so we can just use the Android Trustzone-based key store. The attacker should not be able to extract the, the authentication keys and should not be able to clone the, the platform authenticator. Web authentication has two main stages. In the first stage, the user generates the keeper, uses key attestation to prove that they were generated in secure hardware, and sends the certificate to the server. If the certificate is valid, the server registers the user with the public key. Then, when the user wants to log in, the server sends a unique cha challenge, and the after getting user consent, the device signs the challenge with the private key in the secure hardware. If the signature is valid, the user is signed in. Using our attacks, we can downgrade the authentication key to a vulnerable encryption version. We can use the IV reuse attack to fully recover the key material. And now we can clone the platform authenticator and we can sign any server challenge. In our demo on Galaxy S10, we use GDB to implement the downgrade attack and then use, use our previous um, IV reuse attack to, to recover the private key. We use the strong key FIDO2 server and the sample application without any modifications. After registration, we recover the private key. Uh, we recover the private key of the authentication key blob we verify it against the attestation certificate, and to complete our demo, we use a separate alternative application that does not use Trustzone and simply uses the recovered key. We managed to successfully authenticate against Strongkey's server, uh, Strongkey's remote server over the internet. We disclosed our findings to Samsung last year, and they issued two high severity CVEs and patched over 100 million devices. 
Now, our research involved a lot of extensive reverse engineering. And uh, about a month ago, the Lapso Sucker Group leaked, leaked the entire Samsung source code. So now you can verify the patches. And you can see that they, they used to check the IV key parameter and use it if possible. And otherwise, they would randomize the IV. And now they, they put a little comment instead. They also completely removed the legacy key blob in the uh, legacy encryption version. And uh, now only the third variation is supported. We'd like to think that if this code was open source, then those issues would have been found years ago, hopefully before reaching production devices. And if not, it would still make our research much easier and much faster to complete. What can we learn from this? First of all, the root cause of both issues is API misuse. The client should not be able to set the encryption IV or the encryption version. Also, the key master as a security critical application should have minimal attack surface and should not involve any hidden code. Instead, the, the IVs in ASGCM should be unique or random, uh, or we can use a misuse resistant construction instead. We should also always use the latest encryption version if possible. The bigger issue is in the composability with higher level protocols that rely on the hardware protection. In protocols like web authentication, a remote trusted, public, a remote trusted party uses key attestation to verify that the key was generated in secure hardware. As we've just seen for Samsung devices, the secure hardware implementation was flawed and the cryptographic keys were extracted. But the FIDO server has no way of knowing that those devices are vulnerable and to reject such, such certificates because the attestation certificate does not contain any information about the vendor-specific encryption method. Also, in fact, the, as long as we have vendor-specific black box design, we can't actually prove the correctness of the composition. We, we hope that our research will motivate a uniform open standard for the key master to prevent such is issues in the future. In conclusion, we saw the dangerous pitfalls that arise when the cryptographic design is kept secret. We, we'd like to argue that the cryptographic design should be reviewed by independent researchers and should not rely on the difficulty of reverse engineering proprietary systems. We also advocate for an open standard design. Finally, we think that the, the design choice of the fragile ASGCM should, should raise discussion after too many years of IV reuse in real world systems. Thank you for your time. Feel free to ask any questions. Uh, thanks, I love hardware security stuff. Um, so you showed us how Samsung's fix for this problem was to remove the legacy uh, you know, backwards compatibility path. Um, so did they ship that fix to existing pieces of hardware? And if so, did they have any kind of like migration path for old key blobs that um, weren't encrypted um, with that unique hash? So they shipped it in a firmware updates and uh, you can update the key master trusted application in such updates. And uh, they claim that the legacy encryption version should not be used at all in the wild. But, but as we saw, an attacker can force and just ask for such creation, but they claim that uh, it shouldn't exist at all. So no, maybe... any legitimate apps that use it just got broken. Yes. Thank you. There's a question online from James Muir who asks, what would you recommend to replace AES-GCM? A key wrap mode or something else? Uh, there are other constructions that are misuse resistant. Uh, uh, SIV, I think, and uh, maybe a different cipher, 
but uh, or you can just use the cipher uh, with with the recommended uh, usage that uh, NIST recommends. You just thank you. Uh, a great talk, thank you. Um, so I was curious. Well, the web often spec specifies a counter field that the attestation certificate is supposed to conform to. So I'm wondering, did you, did you test against uh, like first party services, uh, and and was the uh, web often key that was stored in TE usable after uh, cloning it? Because it should be rejected after you clone it because the counts no longer match. So, so actually, cloning uh, to a different device is a, a subtle issue because of the counter, but it's not it's not in in the trust zone it's only in the android part so yeah if you actually want to clone it you you actually need to make sure that you update the counter on, on the other device but you can still use it on a different device on or on this device and uh, do it without users knowledge at all oh that's a good point yeah if you control the <laughs> okay yeah all right great thank you we do have time for any more questions All right, seeing none, then uh, please join me in thanking the speaker again. Thank you. Our next speaker in this session will be Luca DeFeo, who will be talking about the insecurity of LGML in OpenVGP. Thank you, Douglas, and uh, ahoy, everyone. I'm Luca De Feo, and I'm going to present a work with Mimetis, Bertram, and Alessandro, all of IBM Research, on uh, OpenPGP and uh, how well Gamal is misused in OpenPGP. So the one slide summary of this presentation is that details matter. So let's say we're writing a NISO standard for how to hang pictures. You must be careful how you uh, state things. An obvious way would be to take hammer and strike the nail. Um, and here in the ambiguity, you see where problems may arrive. So if instead of writing a standard on how to hang pictures, we are writing a standard on how to uh, do cryptography, what's the worst that can happen? Of course, your protocol may be just broken. We've seen this arrive. Um, something that may happen is that the protocol is perfectly fine, the specification is correct, but then the details are in the implementation and there may be some site channel leakage you, you, which you can exploit. We're going to talk about something that's more subtle it's what happens when the specification is about a cryptographic algorithm that has no problem in its own, is just underspecified, and so it's difficult to come with an implementation that's, uh, that's correct. Um, so the easy case is when uh, you have implementations which work, they pass tests, they are secure, but just they don't interoper interoperate because the specification is not clear enough. The worst that can happen is where these implementations do work, they pass tests, they are secure in isolation, but they are insecure when they interoperate, and in a silent way, which is hard to detect. This is exactly what I'm going to uh, uh, show you today. So uh, what's OpenPGP? In case you don't know, it's an uh, encryption standard, well, a more signature encryption standard. Uh, it's an AETF uh, for more than uh, 20 years now. Uh, it is one of the most common ways to encrypt uh, emails, uh, along with SMIME, the SMIME standard. Um, of course, in the real, real world, no one encrypts emails end to end, but here we are only a real world crypto. So raise your hands if you encrypt your emails. Great, okay, proves how real this word is. <laughs> so there are a few implementations because it is a standard, so you, uh, you can implement in many different ways. Um, one of the most popular ones is uh, GPG, uh, also known as GNU-PG, the GNU Privacy Guard. Um, you have Boten, which is used by Thunderbeard since uh, a few releases back. You have Go, uh, which has an implementation of uh, the parts of the standard in the standard library. Uh, Libcrypto++, which is usually used for research purposes. And there is more. Uh, some of these are not even open source and we don't know about them. 
Um, as for the specification, there are a few RFCs, but the only one what, that really defines all the protocols and what's supposed to be in OpenPGP is the 4880, uh, which is not really a specification on the crypto, but just on the message format, what uh, an OpenPGP message looks like. And so if you open this RFC and you look into it, you will see that there are a few uh, cryptographic algorithms which you're supposed to, which you can implement if you're implementing the OpenPGP standard. Uh, you have a bunch of hash functions, uh, a bunch of uh, symmetric ciphers. Then you have public key encryptions. Um, at the moment, the only ones that are in the RFC are RSA, LGMAL, and ECDH. Although if you take specific implementations, they may implement something more, for example, GPG. Uh, if I remember correctly, implement something more. Um, and then you have also signature algorithms, RSA, DSA, and ECDSA. And this talk is about encryption, and specifically on the LGAMAL part of this uh, standard. And when I say LGAMAL, I really mean the uh, 90s LGAMAL, so finite field LGAMAL, no elliptic curves in this scheme. So you take a finite field and you do LGAMAL as it was first published back in the, uh, in the 80s. Um, and if you look at the standard that was written until not long ago, you will see that El Gamal is the only mandatory encryption algorithm. Although it's definitely not the most popular. The most popular is RSA in the OpenPGP ecosystem. Um, and now, what does it mean to use RSA? What does it mean to use El Gamal? Because the RFC doesn't really define these cryptographic algorithms. The RFC just points to places where you will find the definitions of the algorithms. So for RSA, it's the PKCS standard, which is standard, uh, fairly used. ECDH, uh, it sends to two specifications, one by NIST and one the RFC. Uh, DSA and ECDSA is just the FIPS standard, which is the, the only one that's used for DSA style signatures. And El Gamal, well, turns out there is no El Gamal standard at all. So what the specification does is point to uh, two places. Uh, El Gamal's original paper, from 85, and the Handbook of Applied Cryptography, which is 10 years uh, younger than El Gamal. So let's open the books. What do they say? Uh, I, I'm afraid it's a bit small to read at the back, uh, but I'll help you. Uh, on the left, uh, oh, is there a laser? Okay, no. On the left, you have the handbook, and on the right, you have uh, the um, uh, El Gamal paper. So they both say that you should take a large random prime P and the generator alpha of the multiplicative group. Okay, El Gamal definitely doesn't say how you should choose the prime, uh, whereas the handbook says that you should use algorithm 4.84. Now, don't go look at that algorithm. It's terrible. You don't want to implement it. It's never going to work. Um, next, you need to select a random integer, A, which is going to be your secret exponent, and both agree that it should be somewhere between one and p minus two. Uh, El Gamal is not entirely clear if you, if you take the extremes of the range. It doesn't really matter much for security, both are fine. Um, and then, yeah, the other place, it's uh, when you do the encryption part, uh, how do you choose the ephemeral exponent? And again, it's one between one and p minus two, uh, depending on which specification you read. So they seem to agree more or less on what El Gamal encryption is, although they don't say how you should generate the prime, which is fairly important, of course, if you want to implement this. And so what did we do? We, we went fishing in the wild and see what kind of uh, choices the various libraries have made. And so we find a wild range of different choices, some of which do not even match the specification in the handbook and in El Gamal's paper. Uh, so for the choice of the prime, you have various families, uh, safe primes, nor primes, limli primes, and other stuff, some of which we couldn't even guess what it was. Um, I'll get back to this later. Um, for the generator of the group, so this is very important for people who do uh, proofs, for example. Uh, when you do provable security, you always assume the group is of prime order if you, you have a generator of the group. This does not match the definition of El Gamal and the handbook. And so this is a delicate choice. And some implementations choose to do like in El Gamal's paper. Some others choose a generator of the primitive subgroup, of the prime order subgroup. 
And then for the private and public key, well, of course, you need to take some exponents. You need to take them from some range. It's obvious that you could take them between 0 and p, uh, but some use a short exponent uh, optimization because you can, in the finite field setting at least, you can take exponents which are only 200 bits instead of being 2,000 bits and still have a reasonable security, at least heuristically. And so some libraries do because it's a 10 times uh, speed up. That's not nothing. But of course, when you have all this variety, uh, all these different uh, ways of interpreting the standard and all these disagreements, what's the worst ca that can happen? And so there is one very classical example of uh, engineering mistakes where two components didn't agree fully on the standard and things went completely haywire. That's the much orbiter history uh, story where you had NASA and uh, Lockheed Martin who were producing components for this uh, satellite to be sent uh, in orbit around Mars. And NASA was picking uh, metric units and Lockheed Martin was picking uh, imperial units. And this led to a miscalculation of the trajectory of the satellite which crashed into Mars. Or maybe went out of orbit, we don't know actually. Not so bad in our case. No one uh, got injured, we hope. Uh, what did we find? We studied three popular libraries, uh, NewPG, uh, Crypto++, and uh, sorry, four. Uh, NewPG, Button, Libro, uh, Crypto++, and Go. And we found that they, none of them follows the RFC because of these minor variations, but they are each secure if taken in, in isolation. They interoperate correctly and securely. There is no problem if you encrypt a message with GPG to someone who's decrypting with Boten. Perfectly fine. Um, Go is slightly different in that it does not implement key generation, uh, and actually it's, it does everything perfectly fine. Go is the least offender in the list, uh, so I won't speak much about Go because uh, apart for uh, some uh, side, side, side channel leakage, um, which Go is not trying to prevent anyway, everything is fine. Plus, I think Go has or is deprecating Elgamal encryption. <laughs> Thank you, Filippo. And <laughs> the real problems come from keys we found in the wild. Because, okay, we could analyze these libraries which are open source, but uh, there are other libraries which we don't know nothing about, which we which may be using the OpenPGP standard. So we went looking for public keys which are registered on public uh, PGP server and see what we could find. So by factoring the uh, order of the groups, we could understand some things on how these keys were generated, not always everything, because sometimes factoring is too hard. What a surprise. We need quantum computers. And we found that among 800,000 keys, uh, only 2,000 of those, about 2,000 of those, are vulnerable to a practical uh, plain text recovery attack, um, which only can only be exploited when uh, one among uh, GPG, Bolton, or Crypto++ encrypts a message to these public keys. We don't know who generated these public keys, because these public keys clearly were not generated by any of the libraries we studied. So, some other software generated these keys. And if you are the unhappy user of the software, you have a problem if someone with GPG is sending messages to you. Some other findings we had uh, are also uh, some side channel conditions in uh, essentially all the libraries we looked at. Uh, the most interesting one is GPG because GPG claimed to be side channel resistant. And we showed that there is still some leakage in the, um, in the exponentiation routine of GPG, which you can exploit to do a plain text or more seriously key, uh, secret key recovery. Um, and also in this case, we found that if uh, if you work in a, it's in a scenario where one library is generating the key and another library, a different library, is doing uh, the, uh, the encryption, then you can uh, more easily uh, implement these side channel attacks. And so, uh, collectively, we, call, we refer to these as cross configuration attacks because they come from the interplay between different libraries that have made different algorithmic choices on what it means to do LGML encryption. And now I'm going to just give an idea of the first one, the one that does not use side channels, uh, just to give you an intuition of how it works. It, it's fairly simple um, uh, if you 
stick with me. So the problem comes from the choice of what prime you pick. And so as I said, there are more than one, uh, there's more than one choice. Your goal is to pick a prime P such that P minus one has a large prime factor because then you have a strong discrete logarithm problem uh, related to that large prime factor. So one popular choice is safe primes. So primes of the form two times Q plus one, where Q is prime. Um, but these are kind of expensive to generate. Uh, nowadays it's perfectly fine, but back in the 90s, the GPG developers found those quite uh, unusable. So there was another choice, which was popular at the time, which was uh, essentially appeared in a paper by Lim Lee, and which proposed to use two times many, a product of many primes, all large, uh, but none as large as what you would have in a safe prime. Um, so this is a, an easier uh, prime to generate uh, in terms of uh, power you need to spend, time you need to spend to find these primes. Um, and it protects essentially against the same attacks against which uh, safe primes protect. And then you have a different way of generating these primes, which is which we call the Schnorr way, because it's essentially the way that's recommended to, uh, to do Schnorr signatures, to do uh, DSA, it's what you find in FIPS. Um, it's definitely the cheapest way to generate these uh, safe primes, which is you first choose Q, the, order, the prime order, and then you multiply by any uh, cofactor until you find a prime of the form two times Q times cofactor plus one. And half here can be arbitrary and usually will have small factors. But this is not a problem because you have the Q factor which is large. You have other choices. You can take random primes and just cross your fingers. Don't do that. Maybe some people have done it. We don't know. And then we definitely found other ways that primes were generated. And we don't know exactly the algorithms, but it's clear that they did something strange. And so when we looked at these 800,000 keys in the wild, this is what we found. The vast majority of primes are just come from a list of only 16 primes, which someone must have standardized, but we couldn't find the standard. So we don't know where these primes come from. We found a few in some mailing list messages, but we don't know who's using these primes and why. Uh, and only a very tiny fraction of these safe primes were actually generated, and so they may come from Crypto++ or Bhutan. Um, another fairly large part is a Limli style primes, so this is matches the GPG implementation, so they are probably generated by GPG. And then you have a small family which we call quasi-safe because the way that is they are generated, it's close to the way you would generate safe primes, but they're not safe doesn't mean they are unsafe. Actually, they are not vulnerable to our attack. And then even a smaller percentage, but which is actually quite popular in the last five years, we found, is uh, Schnorr style primes. So these primes where it's two times Q times something, some cofactor F, which may be quite smooth. And so this is where we have the plain text recovery attack. And against these particular sets of keys, there's only 2,000 of them uh, in the whole set. So how does the attack work? Picture this uh, prime. P minus one is equal to two times Q times some product of small factors. So you can imagine this L3, L4 to be small uh, primes. Five, seven, a million three, whatever. And you want to solve the discrete logarithm of alpha to the power X. So you want to find X. What you do, uh, textbook, Pauli Gelman, you can decompose this problem uh, from a discrete logarithm in the full group of order p minus one to several discrete logarithms in the groups of orders two, q, l3, l4, etc. Now, for some of these, if the prime is small, you will easily solve these discrete logarithms by using polar row or whatever exhaustive search even, if it's two. Um, and so you will get x mod the order of each of these groups. You won't get x mod q because that's the large order subgroup, so you have no chances of doing that. But if you have enough primes, if you have two L3, L4, and they are, their product is big enough, then you can use the Chinese remainder theorem and recompute x mod two times L3 times L4, which normally wouldn't give you x because you still meet, miss the x mod q. But if x was chosen to be short, which is a common optimization used by GPG, used by Boton, used by Libro Crypto++, then you have a problem because you have found all of X. And so this is exactly what we did, as simple as that. Elgamal encryption, just for uh, recall what it is, it is uh, prime P, generator alpha, the message is M, you take a random Y, then you put the generator to the power Y, and this is where we can solve one discrete logarithm, 
and the other way where the other side where we can solve the discrete logarithm is in the public key, which is alpha power x. So either we can find x or we can find y, depending on whether it's x or y that is uh, short. And so now if we look at what things are done in practice, well, first thing that may happen is that uh, you have a Schnorr style prime, alpha generates the full group, and the secret key is short. Uh, this is an attack which is not cross configuration and was already proposed in the, back in the 90s, and no library is vulnerable to that because it's a well-known attack. Well, we weren't much smarter than this. We just looked, okay, which libraries have short exponents for the encryption part, so for the Y, and which public keys have Schnorr type of prime and generators that generate the full group. When these libraries uh, interact, uh, when these libraries interact, then you have a problem because the first three things, the P minus one, the alpha and the X, they are chosen by the library which is generating the public key. Whereas the last thing is chosen by the library that's encrypting. So if they do not agree on how to do things, you have a problem. And yeah, this is how we, break, uh, we broke uh, the things. Um, looking again slightly more in details at this whole set of public keys, the two lines in red are the kinds of public keys against which we can mount the attack, which is more or less practical depending on how unlucky you were during your key generation. But for some of those keys, we could definitely run the attack on a laptop. Um, and just one last word on the side channel. As I told you, we also have some side channel attacks. They also use these same kind of things where the leakage gives you some information on the public key, but you still need to run a little bit of discrete log computation to find the missing bits of the secret key. Uh, our uh, framework is a co-located attacker. For example, in a cloud environment, one core is running uh, GPG and the other core is the attacker, and you can find the secret key uh, this way. And so, this is pretty easy against uh, Crypto++ and Go. Against GPG, it's interesting because uh, if you at try and attack GPG, it's pretty tough. Like, we don't have the resources to do it. Uh, but if you suppose that the key was generated by Crypto++ and then fed to GPG, and then it's GPG that does the decryption routine, then in that case, the attack becomes much easier just because Crypto++ takes even shorter exponents than GPG. And in that case, depending on how lucky or unlucky against, again you were, the attack will be within reach of a nation state actor or uh, even within reach of my laptop. And that's it. Thanks for your attention and questions. Thanks for the great talk. Um, you said you could do some of the attacks on a laptop, but could you do it in a weekend on a laptop? <laughs> um, I mean, the, the attack, the, the plain text uh, recovery attack, it's even a few hours, so much better than a weekend. So this is all basically that they don't implement key validation. They don't, they don't say the key comes in, is it of the right form, is the generator, blah, blah, blah. This is all stuff that was known in the 90s and, and deployed in elliptic curve protocols. Do they also do not do the stuff for the elliptic curve versions? Elliptic curve is a bit more solid because they implement the RFC. So uh, okay. it's, uh, it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, th th these are things that could have been prevented, but the RFC doesn't even give, even give you the ways to prevent them because there's not enough information in the public key format. And, and uh, just a more, more sort of really basic, Elgamal naively just encrypts a message. How are they actually using Elgamal? Because to say we're going to Elgamal encrypt doesn't mean anything for a, an email. So what, what does that, what does it's, that actually it's mean? It's hybrid encryption. It's, uh, you, you use Elgamal and then uh, to, to, to encrypt the secret key, uh, an, an AES secret key or some other symmetric cipher secret key. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, so uh, I saw a slide that said that uh, these implementations were proven secure in isolation. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, like, what, because they're not secure when they're interoperating, uh, what was the failure in the, the security proofs? And is there any insight on how to do? I didn't proofs? say proven. 
I oh. said they are secure in, uh, in isolation. That's uh, to the best of our knowledge. That's, as far as we can tell, they are secure. I didn't say there is a security proof. Oh, okay. uh, but we are talking about the algorithm. So, uh, I mean, El Gamal has the usual security proofs in the ROM, etc. So in that sense, they are proven secure. So this is not a problem of security proofs, because we're really talking about some very basic cryptographic primitive encryption. Again, since this is transporting a symmetric key and it's, it's not exactly what is proven secure in CCA secure, but I mean, in practice, they are secure uh, if they implement one of the safe versions of El Gamal. And each in isolation implements a safe version of El Gamal. All right, thank you. Very quick questions. So, uh, did you consider the actual PGP software by Simon Tech, which used to be open source as a book on Amazon, uh, and no. you could generate no. keys with Simon Tech software and test we, we, them? No, we didn't. Is that software still around? I'm afraid in corporate setups, it's rarely used. Okay, it may explain some of our findings. Like, well, we still have a lot of questions on where do these keys come from. We don't know. Have there been any changes to libraries as a result of this, or are they still continuing with this? Absolutely, area? it's all patched. Like, okay. Uh, Botan has patched, so Thunder be the safe, uh, GPG has patched, it's fine. There's also a question online about the uh, Schnorr primes possibly matching the Oakley group, so please take a look there and uh, on, uh, discuss on the Zulip. Please join me in thanking our speakers again. Okay, so Hello? Now it's working, great. So let's see, for the next session, our session chair will be Dan Bonet. Uh, he is online, so we are just setting up so we can see him as well as later on the invited speaker he will introduce. Yes, thanks a lot. Can everybody see me? Okay, Dan, we can see you. I think you see the queue for questions at the yes. top there. And yeah, as soon as you're done with your introduction, then we will see slides and the speaker. Thanks. Terrific. All right. So uh, thank you, Helena. Uh, uh, let's see. So welcome, everyone, to our last technical session of the day. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Michael Clubber, who's going to talk, tell, tell us about Google's efforts in providing privacy in the ad ecosystem. So Michael, floor, floor is yours. Please go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Uh, can you all both hear me and see my slides? Are we technically set here? Yeah, we can hear you. Maybe just uh, increase your volume a little bit. Hmm, increase my volume. Uh, okay, I'll try to talk louder. I don't know what else there is to do other than that. And slides are good? You can see yep, my slides also? Good. Excellent. Great, okay, good, cool, thank you very much. Um, so hello, uh, I am Michael Kleber. I'm a software engineer at Google. I work on the Chrome web browser and specifically on a Chrome effort called the Privacy Sandbox. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan and others, for the invitation to talk. I'm very sorry that I'm unable to join you in person. Um, the starting point of this work dates back to 2018. Uh, that was, uh, hold on a sec, what are we doing this? There we go. Uh, that was the year that uh, Bashir and Wilson had a PETS paper, uh, Diffusion of User Tracking Data in the Online Advertising Ecosystem. Uh, they instrumented a web browser to understand the widespread cookie matching practices that were used by the online advertising industry. Um, they found that there were 52 ads and analytics companies that were each able to build a pseudonymous profile, which contained more than 90% of the URLs visited by an average web browser. And if you lower your threshold for yikes from 90% to uh, observing 50% of the URLs that a browser visits, the number of companies that could do that skyrocketed to over 600. Um, so the Bashir and Wilson paper was focused on tracking using third-party cookies, that is, uh, using pseudonymous identifiers 
that one particular domain can read and write any time a source from that domain is used in a web page that you visit. Um, it is more pervasive than that description makes it sound, though, because the advertising industry maintains giant cookie matching tables. So that is, even though foo.com and bar.com seem to have two different pseudonymous identifiers, they may cooperate with each other to let both of them learn about a web page, even if only one of the two interacts with your browser. Um, beyond cookies, the same sort of cross-site trafficking uh, also happens in more covert ways, particularly using uh, device fingerprinting techniques. Uh, so some other related things were also happening in 2018. Uh, first, uh, GDPR came into effect in the EU. Uh, I think many people hoped that would lead to a dramatic decrease in the type of tracking that I'm talking about. But observations since then are that it instead led to a dramatic increase in cookie consent banners. Uh, also in 2018, uh, Apple's uh, Safari web browser started blocking third-party cookies from some particularly large and prevalent sites with the release of uh, WebKit ITP 2.0. Um, it eventually, uh, Safari eventually switched to blocking all third-party cookies in 2021. Um, the impacts here are a lot more complicated. Uh, just to point out a few things, uh, they include some ad tech switching from cookies to fingerprinting or other types of covert tracking. And they include some content and therefore some ad money and therefore some tracking moving from the web to the app ecosystem instead. Uh, those two things are actually interrelated because uh, in apps, the fingerprinting problem is both easier to do and harder to study. Uh, I don't plan to talk more about the app side of this story today, but if you're interested in this topic, uh, the Kalnig et al. Uh, preprint, uh, whose title starts goodbye tracking question uh, mark that just came out last week is an amazing piece of research that I highly recommend you, uh, you, you go and read. I love it. Um, OK. Uh, so perhaps some of these outcomes surprise you, like why would all of these things happen? And the answer is it turns out that this tracking that we're talking about really does make money. Um, I stole this literature review slide from Garrett Johnson from Boston University's Questrom School of Business um, across studies from academia and industry. Those are the gray rows, which you might be more suspicious of, um, and government agencies. Uh, we have pretty consistent results. Uh, if you stop using third-party cookies for targeting, then most ad-supported websites lose something like 50% to 70% of their revenue. And listen, by the way, I, I we, we all know that I work for Google, so let me be clear that uh, Google is not a site that would suffer that kind of loss. Google makes a lot of money on ads, it is true, but most of that is from ads on the Google search results page. And the ad choices there don't need third-party cookies to help guess what kind of ad to show you, right? People who come to google.com type into a little box exactly what we should show them the ads for. Um, so, and there are some other sites that are likewise just fine. There are web pages about reviews of new cell phones, and they're great. They don't need third-party cookies either to know to show you ads about reviews for hot new cell phones you might buy. But web pages about the Omicron variant or about climate change, like ad space there really benefits from those cookies. Um, the Google AB experiment, uh, row five in gray on this slide, measured an average of 52% revenue loss overall, but an average of 62% revenue loss specifically when you look at news sites. So some sites are affected much more than others. Um, okay, so let me point out two consequences of this revenue loss number. Uh, thing one 
if we did have a way to just stop all tracking and people couldn't substitute a different tracking technique or a different platform, then a lot of sites would make a lot less money, right? Maybe not that full 50 to 70% revenue hit. That's not an equilibrium outcome, but most of it. Um, and so a lot of people would lose their jobs. There would be many fewer sites. There would be much less on the web. Uh, but a second thing that is maybe less obvious that I want to point out is that if you turn that lose 50 to 70% around, what it means is that if you imagine a world without cookies, someone who figures out how to do tracking can go around to all of these websites and ad tech companies and sell themselves as, hey, if you use my circumvention technique, then websites get a twofold to threefold increase in their revenue. Right. And that is an extremely strong incentive to keep doing whatever it takes to keep tracking people. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, somebody posted in a chat an archive reference and I haven't followed it up. So I'm not sure what that is. Thank you. Um, OK, so now at last uh, I can tell you uh, what the pro problem is that Chrome's privacy sandbox is trying to solve. Uh, first, we want to stop all of this user tracking uh, and, in particular, uh, change the web so that it no longer supports building a profile of a single person as they browse across a lot of unrelated websites. Um, and second, we want to ensure that web developers who use third-party cookies today, and that includes the online advertising ecosystem, we want to ensure that these folks have other ways to accomplish their goals with better privacy properties built in. Right? And it's really much harder if you try to do one of these two tasks without the other. right? Because if the new, more private techniques work as well or nearly as well as the old tracking-based ways, then yes, it will take a bunch of work, but we can migrate the ads ecosystem to use them. But on the other hand, if there remains a huge revenue gap between tracking-based monetization and privacy-preserving monetization, then we will see all of that work of this billions of dollars a year industry going into circumvention and covert tracking instead. Okay, so with that, as motivation, I'm now going to zoom in on two specific capabilities that we Chrome want to add to the web to keep ads working without user tracking. OK, uh, the first one is a way to perform on device ad auctions. We have proposed a system called Fledge. Uh, that's based on an earlier proposal called Turtle Dove. I apologize for all of the bird references. Things got a little out of hand in 2020. I think we've mostly recovered from that phase. Uh, anyway, uh, okay, so for Fledge, the basic flow looks like this. Um, uh, unfortunately, the ad tech ecosystem is extremely complicated, which has forced some amount of complexity into the system that we are designing to support it but in as simple a form as possible. Uh, the flow is at some point, a person browses a website and some advertiser or more likely an ad tech company working for some advertiser says, aha, based on what you just did, I would like to show my ads to you in the future. Uh, in the conventional world of advertising with third party cookies, this would involve putting the person's pseudonymous identifier on a list of people interested in something and then recognizing that identifier during their future ad requests. In the Fledge model, instead, at that point, when somebody does something that leads you to want to show them ads in the future, um, uh, the advertiser hands the browser a bundle of information, which we are calling an interest group. And that consists primarily of first a collection of ads that the advertiser might want to show the person in the future. Uh, and second, an on-device bidding function. So a piece of JavaScript which will run in the future and which will decide how much the advertiser is willing to pay to have their ad appear in a particular ad slot. And that on-device bidding function will get to run lots of times. And if the bid that it comes up with is high enough, then the corresponding ad will appear sometimes. So then later, uh, the same person visits a website that wants to show ads, right? We call those sites publishers. Um, 
And the ad tech company working for the publisher runs a normal contextual ad auction. This is a world where there's no third party cookies anymore, but you can still run a normal ad auction based on, for example, the context of the page that you're in the middle of visiting. And then follows that up with an on device auction among those previously stored interest groups. Each interest group is a potential buyer in this auction. Their previously stored JavaScript functions each get a chance to emit a bid. And then the seller who is running the auction scores those bids with their own on device JavaScript that picks the one that the publisher site likes best, whether that's the one that gets them the most money or some other criteria, whatever. Uh, the JavaScript bidding and scoring functions all are isolated in that they don't get to interact with the web page or with the servers or with storage. Um, uh, and we want some, there, there are some other constraints also. We would like to ensure that the ads that we're showing are being seen by at least uh, K different people. We want some kind of K anonymity. It helps with privacy properties of the reporting, which I'll touch on a little later. Uh, and it also may help the ads from feeling uh, too creepy. Uh, and the distributed canonymity check is tricky for all the reasons that you folks here can imagine. Um, but I would like to uh, talk about a bigger problem that I've been uh, sweeping under the rug. Um, those JavaScript bidding functions actually do need some real-time information. Uh, they cannot actually bid in isolation just using the preloaded data sitting on the device. Uh, and just for a few examples, um, every ad campaign has some budget, like some amount of money that they can spend this day or this week or this month. Um, if they're out of cash, they cannot spend more money to buy more ad space. Uh, that's generally not allowed when you're buying things. Um, and also, uh, advertisers need to be able to stop serving ads on a particular site right away, right? If their ad appears on what turned out to be a COVID disinformation site, they can't say, well, we don't support this message, but it will take us a week before we stop giving them money and buying their ad space. Like they, you know, actually need to be able to control things in real time. Um, so for these sorts of use cases, the Fledge proposal actually allows each interest group to store in the browser alongside the collection of ads and bidding logic, uh, store some lookup keys. Um, uh, 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 sorry, yeah. Um, store some lookup keys, um, which are used at the time of the on-device auction to retrieve some associated values from a database. So of course, if we just sent a server the set of keys whose values we want to retrieve, this lookup operation itself would be a privacy leakage, a tracking vector. We could avoid that risk with some type of private information retrieval scheme. But the scale here is daunting. Like the key value database that we need to query is large. It has, there are millions of ad campaigns and that's crossed with millions of websites. Every ad campaign might have different opinions about which websites it's willing to run on. Um, it's being queried billions of times a day, like every web page that is loaded. Um, also the database changes very quickly. Even if you imagine an average database entry changes only once per day, that already does not play well with a PIR scheme that relies on like substantial offline pre-processing in order to get sublinear retrieval. Um, I, I don't yet know whether PIR is a viable solution at the scale that we're talking about. Um, uh, or whether instead we have to rely on some kind of trusted hardware based solution, like a cloud provider's trusted execution environment. Uh, for example, AWS Nitro TPM or Azure's uh, secure enclaves that are rooted in Intel SGX. Uh, the answer here may come down to how much overhead you're willing to pay to avoid trusting that a cloud provider like Amazon or uh, Azure won't mount a physical side channel attack on the machine's house in its own data center. Um, okay, finally, second, I wanna turn to one other crucial part of the online advertising ecosystem uh, that is uh, much less visible than the ad selection process. And that's the task of measuring whether ads actually had the desired effect. 
Uh, this question applies to all types of ad targeting, whether it's an on device auction like Fledge or is purely contextual targeting. Um, the essential goal here is attributing conversions and I'll define both words. Um, a conversion is when a person does whatever an advertiser hoped that they would do. The most obvious is buying something on the advertiser's website. Uh, attribution is the task of associating a conversion with some previous ad that the person saw or interacted with. That is an attribution is an attempt to give credit to the ad that led to the conversion. Um, in reality, advertisers often stick to correlation, not causation. That's a real pity. Uh, I think you heard James Ray's talk earlier, which touched on the harder problem of trying to actually measure causality. I'm going to stick to the so-called easy task for now. Um, advertisers usually use one of a few very simple models to account for the fact that the same person may have seen multiple ads from the same advertiser in the time leading up to the conversion, right? When a conversion happens, uh, you can say, well, the credit for that goes to the most recent ad the person saw, that's called last touch attribution, or maybe they use first touch attribution, like as if the first ad planted the seed that later bore fruit when the conversion happened, or there are other models in which multiple ads share parts of the credit spread out uniformly across all the ads or with exponential time decay. So the most recent ad is the most important and so on. Like there are lots of different possibilities for how to do this. Um, but at a high level, when an advertiser shows an ad, they have just spent money and then a conversion later involves them making money. And so the conversion attribution is trying to get at the question of whether the spend was worth it. That answer might show up in the reporting that advertisers look at when they decide how to spend their money in the future or might feed into an ad tech company training a machine learning model to optimize return on investment on behalf of the advertisers that they work with. Um, so conversion measurement is just crying out for the type of generalized privacy preserving noise aggregation that Christopher Patton talked about uh, uh, at this time yesterday. Uh, advertisers want to know things like what fraction of people who saw my ad on site X later bought something, right? Historically, they've done this using third party cookies, of course. They use a pseudonymous identifier to recognize the person who saw the ad, and then they see that same pseudonymous identifier at the time the person makes the purchase. But that's overkill. Like what they really want to know is a quite privacy compatible question about groups, not about individuals. But unfortunately, this all gets more complicated because there are lots of different parties involved, right? And in fact, maybe some of you have already spotted the trap hiding here, but uh, just, just to be clear, uh, one advertiser might run ads through different ad networks. Their ads are certainly going to appear on many different websites. Each ad network wants to report about how the ads that it showed correlated with subsequent conversions. That report involves a person's actions on at least two sites, the one where they saw the ad and the one where they converted, and is being reported to an ad network that's often a third party in both cases, or maybe even more parties uh, who were involved and who want to know things if the person saw multiple ads, right? So the question is, how do they all share epsilon? Like aggregation with differential private noise, that's eating up someone's epsilon budget. But whose budget is it? And how is it allocated among all of these parties? Like there are a lot of possible answers here and every one of them is bad, or at least every one of them has its downsides. Like either different ad tech companies are competing to steal epsilon budget from one another, or else they might try to game the system by collaborating or by taking one big ad tech company and splitting it into multiple smaller ad tech companies. Or even if everyone somehow wants to play nicely with one another, they need to orchestrate carefully to avoid the reporting on one event starving another event of reporting budget by accident. Like with some budgeting schemes, completely independent ads on the same page are in competition for Epsilon budget. And in those cases, fair choices about who can report what involve like information propagating backwards in time. And finally, uh, in case you thought that all of that actually has answers and it's straightforward and you know how to do it, I'll point out that for the optimization use case, we need to share Epsilon while also training machine learning models using this aggregated data. 
uh, the Microsoft Mask Lark proposal that was mentioned yesterday in the MPC aggregation context is one indication of how this might be possible. Uh, French ad company Criteo ran a contest last year that pointed to additional approaches, but this is very definitely not yet settled. Um, so that's where I'll stop. Uh, there's uh, lots of real world with some kind of crypto shaped holes in them. And I hope that we can come back and talk to you next year about what is done, not uh, just what is in progress. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Michael. This is a really good overview of, uh, of what's happening in the space. Uh, I guess one question that, come, that came up is uh, this issue of uh, fraud prevention, in particular things like uh, click fraud and um, other fraud prevention in the ad ecosystem. How how is this how is all this privacy technology going to uh, interact with uh, fraud prevention in the ecosystem? Yeah, uh, that that's an outstanding question. Uh, as I said, the things I mentioned are just two small pieces of the larger privacy sandbox question. Um, so. Uh, some answers is that uh, there are uh, uh, a few different fraud prevention proposals that are uh, in the middle of being worked on side by side with all of these um, that rely on uh, uh, trust tokens, so privacy pass style uh, uh, blind signatures uh, in order to help move kind of information around um, uh, in a way that is, you know, provably non-identifiable, but at the same time lets you uh, at least bind the fact that a person seemed to be trustworthy in one environment. Uh, and then you can say, well, if you're trustworthy in this environment, then you're probably trustworthy in this other environment, even though I don't have a single identifier to recognize that you are the same person that was considered trustworthy over in that other environment. Um, and Similar sort of blind signatures thing um, uh, can be used, for example, as part of the conversion attribution things to make sure that the um, uh, the individual events, like the impression event and the conversion event, individually look trustworthy, and then you can uh, uh, pass along some sense of trust in those uh, uh, through the association attribution process. Um, but I, I mean, in in a broader sense, the answer is. There is not a end-to-end -end answer to this question. Uh, really, I didn't spend a lot of my time here talking about fingerprinting, right? The gathering up lots of little bits of information in order to uh, uh, track people, like in order to uniquely identify devices. Um, it turns out that the, the, the pieces of information that are used in fingerprinting have a bunch of overlap <laughs> with pieces of information that are used in fraud detection and fraud prevention. Um, it, that gets into complicated questions of whether there really is a feasible, like technical purpose limitation approach so that we can let people collect information if they're willing to use it for some things, but not if they're willing to use it for other things. In the business world, people get away with doing that by signing contracts with each other all the time. Unfortunately, web browsers don't have a contract that they are signing with every website. So we can't tell a website, you can only have this information if you promise to do good things with it. Um, but there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out if there is some approximation of that approach, perhaps with the cooperation of uh, uh, national privacy regulators, for example, uh, that make some kind of purpose limitation uh, actually feasible uh, as, a, as a privacy help. So actually, uh, yeah, that's a thanks, Michael. <laughs> that, 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 that's that's clarify things. There's a question in the mic, so uh, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I know there's also proposals for um, having users specify their own ad interests in their browsers. Uh, I'm wondering what your opinion is of that, and also with Fledge, how much visibility and understandability do users have about the ads that are shown to them? Yeah, uh, let me let me answer those in reverse order. Uh, first of all, the 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 options for visibility and like the UI associated with understanding what's going on uh, when the browser has become part of the ad system, so like understands the ads that are being carried around for you and be shown to you is one of the huge wins here. Like there's a, a large amount of work that we have put into the uh, the UI and user experience research going into how we can best have the browser, like it's the user agent, it can act on behalf of the user. And so we have a, a vast amount more understanding. And so uh, things like, why did I see this ad is a question where in the case of like not purely contextually targeted ads, um, we think that 
the browser will be in a position to offer uh, a lot more visibility. Um, the very first uh, uh, versions of this UI are in the version of Chrome beta that is, uh, I think, being installed on your device this week if you are on the beta channel. So uh, please take a look at it. And we'd love to talk about that more soon. Um, in terms of uh, uh, user-specified ad interests, there are a few proposals. There's a proposal called Topics that comes from Chrome. There's a, a few other proposals that are around uh, more user-specified interests. Um, I, I think the answer is, so first of all, obviously all of those need good privacy properties, right? It, it doesn't matter whether you volunteer a set of interests, if they're uniquely identifiable, it's a fingerprint for you. And all of a sudden we're right back to square one on tracking, right? So the browser obviously has some obligation to make sure that whatever information is made available is not enough to like quickly learn who you are. Of course, uh, uh, if you spend a lot of time doing things and change state over time, then eventually for a website that gets to see information about you over a long enough period of time, unless there's, again, some kind of magical purpose limitation that says people can't store information forever, you know, a site that you visit every week for a year is going to have a lot more information as a result of that than a site that you only visit once. Um, so I, I think there's not a perfect answer there. Um, but after the question of, um, uh, can we prevent, you know, prevent this type of information from just being an outright fingerprinting vector? Um, the question of what is sensitive information, like what is information that people are happy to see ads based on versus one that they're not, again, veers over, uh, I mean, they went together in your question for a good reason, right? That veers very directly into user experience uh, research questions about what it is that people are happy with. So, you know, understanding people's expectations and people's sense of whether the browser is doing a good job of not revealing things that they consider like problematic or sensitive, but is, re you know, revealing information that they think enhances their overall experience and usage of the web. Um, User experience research is working on figuring out where to draw that line. I don't think the answer is completely clear, but I think that there's a lot of room to make things dramatically better than where we are today. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Thank so you. I think we're actually we're actually at at uh, time. Uh, at Dan. So, yes. If I could just maybe insert one question from Zulip. There's three over there, so we'll maybe just take one, we <laughs> even if we're a time? little bit over time. Okay, um, okay, I'll pick uh, this one here. Can Fledge be used to prevent competitive click fraud or any fraud in this complex system? If not, what else does Fledge need? And this is a question from Bitul Durak. Oh, actually, I think we already asked that question. <laughs> okay, then I can pick the second one here. There is much less transparency on what happens on in-app advertising on the Android platform. Is there any sharing between Chrome and the Google Mobile Ads SDK, or will there be? And this is a question from Kevin McCurley. Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, as I said, um, there is uh, uh, the, the, the app ecosystem is sort of a very different question. Um, as of two months ago, uh, uh, Android announced that they are interested in the same privacy sandbox approach that uh, that Chrome has been talking about for, I guess, two or three years at this point. Um, so things like Fledge are of interest to Android as well. And they have the first drafts out of their attempts to take the same sort of uh, uh, privacy and on-device ad auction computation and user transparency story and make that available uh, uh, on Android for, for uh, in-app ads as well. Um, that doesn't completely answer the question of is there going to be information sharing of some sort between privacy sandbox inside the web browser and privacy sandbox on the apps, even if they both adopt the same uh, you know, the same approach, they're sort of two different things and they might share data with one another or they might not. I don't have the answer to that right now. I mean, I think that there's going to be different privacy properties. Really, this kind of gets to uh, like what people's idea of privacy is, right? And, and the question of whether privacy is, I mean, privacy is definitely contextually dependent, right? The, 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 you know, a lot of privacy violation comes from taking data from one context and using it, on, you know, contrary to people's expectations in a different context. And to some extent, this Chrome versus Android question gets to the heart of what do you think the right context is? Like, 
there are absolutely people who think that a context is this physical object here that I'm holding in my hand, right? This phone is the context. And so drawing a distinction between what happens in Chrome on this phone and in a non-Chrome app on the same phone is like an artificial distinction that doesn't make sense. And there are people on the other side who think that, no, actually, Chrome and web are totally different from each other. I mean, Chrome and app are totally different from each other. They should have nothing to do with each other at all. Um, those people tend to be more technologists, the people who think that the right uh, uh, scope is the device tend to be users who actually can't tell the difference between whether they're using Chrome or using an app. Um, I, I think the answer to this is something that I will know uh, two or three years from now and that I really don't know now. Great, thank you, okay, Michael. This is, I think this, this uh, topic is going to keep our community busy now for, uh, for many, many years. So thank you for, uh, thank you for presenting this. Um, okay, so with that, uh, let's uh, thank Michael one more time. Uh, Thanks a lot. And uh, Helena, I'll uh, pass it over back to you. Uh, yes, so let me just quickly check. I think on the program, the next session is a discussion session. So we will have Jope Bos, the, uh, the moderator. And I'll stay actually right here so I can read questions and stuff on, on Zulip. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, so this next session, um, as you saw from the title, is a bit different. It's not a technical session, um, and it's about publication. And um, yeah, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to discuss this here, um, since you guys are all, by attending RWC, members of the IECR for next year. And we now finally have a large crowd of people gathered again. We thought it would be great to yeah, have a discussion about this, uh, about publication venues, uh, what the ICR wants, and something we have been working on uh, for now some time, and we'd like to have a discussion about this, uh, about the pros and the cons, and what at least the folks here in the room, but maybe also on, on, on Zoom, think about it, um, such that we can take this into consideration. So maybe for the folks who are not that familiar with the ICR and with publication, let me give a quick summary and how I would like to do this. So I, I give a summary of what we do now, what we have been doing in the last couple of years. I hope to be done in like 10 minutes and then let's open up for a, for a large discussion. So I think that is, that is how I would like to approach this. So the ICR has three uh, main conferences. So EuroCrypt, Crypto and AsiaCrypt. They have, um, when you go to the, you publish a paper, you present it at the conference and the paper is published uh, with Springer in uh, LNCS. Then we have four uh, area conferences. Um, so TCC, PKC, CHESS, and FSE. If you submit a paper now to CHESS or uh, FSE, actually they moved to a journal conference hybrid. So they have these transactions, um, which are hosted by the University of Bochum. And they're completely open. And if you publish with TCC or PKC, your paper, just as with the, the main conferences, uh, Go are being published with Springer. Then, of course, um, we have the, the journal, so the Journal of Cryptology, which is published by Springer, so that is uh, aimed for our best work at the ICR. Then, of course, we have RWC, where we are now. There are no publications, there are presentations uh, for our community. And then, of course, we have ePrint. So, ePrint is our online platform where everybody can submit their papers. Um, and there is no peer review process, um, as long as it's not a random PDF, which since I'm also one of the co-editors of ePrint, I'll try to reject. Um, more or less anything else, if it's crypto related, just gets in, because I will not read all these papers. So what are we talking about here? So I think on the one hand, and then we can open that up for the discussion, is um, where do we see ourselves? And with we, I mean the ICR in, let's say, 10 years uh, in terms of publications. I think this is more a philosophical question. Do we want to remain with Springer? Do we want to have um, models like these transactions? Do we want to host everything ourselves? So this is something you can think about now and maybe in 10 minutes during the discussion you can comment on. Um, but first, I would like to talk a bit about a proposal which um, the board, of, so the board of the ICR, received uh, in mid 2020, 
Um, and you can see the authors listed here. So it was um, a proposal by Paolo Barreto, Sandy Camara, Michael Nerick, Elizabeth Oswald, Tom Riston Part, and Nigel Smart. And then it was endorsed by quite a number of other people from our community uh, to create a new journal. And I will, out in the next couple of slides, outline why they thought um, we needed to create this new journal um, and why this was needed and what in the meantime has been done. Um, then the board took this up. Um, and decided to investigate what is possible and what not. And um, yeah, I volunteered because I really like this proposal. I volunteered to actually chair this, this committee. So in, that's why I'm talking about it here uh, right now. So what was the main motivation for this new journal? Um, so again, this was not something the board came up with. These were members from our community um, who came to the board and they said, yeah, we see that there are a number of problems which how we publish things right now. Um, so if you've ever published in any of our venues, you probably know how it works. Uh, if you have, you might have a very exciting new result. You submit to Eurocrypt. It's a bit of a lottery if you get in. Um, if you do not get in, you resubmit to crypto. You might not get in, you resubmit to AsiaCrypt. And then you do this multiple times until your paper gets in. So this is, of course, very frustrating because you think your paper is really good and it deserves to get in the first time. So for the authors, it's very frustrating, but it's of course also very frustrating for the reviewers because every conference has their own large uh, PC and the, this paper needs to get reviewed over and over again. So it wastes simply a lot of time. Um, this is of course because our field is growing, crypto is growing, which is a good thing, um, but we only have a limited number of slots uh, at our conferences. So as a result, like I said, there's, there's some frustration. Um, people are resubmitting. People are hyping their claims in their paper to convince reviewers, hoping that if the paper looks more sexy, it does get in. Um, and it also means that a lot of students, in order to get their results published, need to travel to various places in the world. Because if you publish somewhere, you need to present your paper. Um, and conferences might become dull just by only presenting scientific results and not the cool stuff. I mean, that is one of the reasons why we have Real World Crypto, where we don't have the more technical papers. They're here as well, but the main selection criteria here is to select the cool stuff, which is happening out there. So the proposal is, let's try and fix these perceived problems. And indeed, we can open up later if you agree or disagree with these perceived problems by creating a new journal which try to address this. So some of the features this new journal uh, should have is that it should be diamond or gold open access. Um, so it should be free. People should just be, should be able to access all the papers for free. Um, and it should have a fast and consistent turnaround time, meaning that once you submit, you would like to have your decision within, let's say, three months, um, such that it allows to scale for our community. So when the community grows, we expect more people uh, submit papers. And then, um, yeah, with the current, uh, how we currently deal with the conferences, um, yeah, this is not a, not a scalable approach. As, moreover, we want to respect all areas in crypto. So of course, we now have our three generic uh, conferences and then we have our four area conferences, but we have, of course, much more areas in crypto besides the four area conferences. And how should we deal with that? Um, so the idea was this journal would be the venue. If you, uh, for instance, have a real world crypto paper, you can submit to this journal. So it's another outlet for our community to publish. Um, and of course, very important, it should not compete with any of these other venues, it should complement. So it's just another publication venue. And then the whole ideology is here that since we want to avoid this competition, making your paper look extra sexy, if your paper is relevant to crypto and it is correct, um, then it should just get in. So not we want to avoid all these discussions, you know, which is more important or we now already have 10 papers on symmetric key. Um, we are going to reject some because otherwise that session will be, would be too large, etc. We want to avoid all of these discussions. So let me, because we now had, a, and I will skip a lot of the details, we talked to a lot of publishers um, and how we could approach things in practice, because it's, of course, when you want to embark upon something like this, it's much more difficult. Um, 
our goal was that, of course, when you submit a paper, it's free. When you access the paper, it's free. And then, of course, there is a cost associated uh, with it. And somehow, and that are the details we still need to figure out, um, it, it would cost the ICR money. And our goal was uh, for this diamond open access that it would cost less than $100 per paper. So when you look around to see if this is realistic, just that people are aware of this, um, here are some, some numbers for a diamond open access or gold open access, uh, which publishers actually charge. And then you see that um, $100 per paper is ridiculously low, um, but we think that, that we are able to do it. But as you can see what other, uh, in, in, in related communities, uh, publishers charge, um, yeah, it goes from a thousand to multiple thousand uh, dollars per paper. So then, yeah, we had a look, how can we do this in practice? So we decided to subdivide the task into three. Um, so we need the solution for the submission and reviewing system. So if you have ever been on a PC, um, you know, so some conferences use EasyChair, for instance, uh, OJS, so the open journal system. Um, if you've been on the PC for, for chess or for FSE, they use hot crap. Um, so there are a bunch of requirements and we were investigating what could we use and what not. Then the second step, of course, after a paper is ref reviewed and you decide which ones do we want to accept uh, and um, put in the journal, then of course you need to create the final versions. And that actually takes a significant amount of time. I, I also do not think that many people are aware of this, but when we spoke, for instance, to the folks behind uh, TCHES and TOSC, um, which is hosted in Bochum, then there are PhD students there and it takes them on average one hour per final version of a paper to create um, or check that everything is in order. So this is actually a significant amount of time and of course does not, does not scale if our community grows. Um, and then there's a problem, of course, if you want to get indexed and recognized as a proper journal, you need to uh, collect all kinds of metadata such that you get indexed uh, by, by various uh, external entities. And then, of course, the last step is the hosting system. Um, so do we want to do this ourselves? Do we want to talk to uh, external publishers and pay them such that they take care of this? If they take care of this, how do we move uh, from step two to step three, et cetera, et cetera. So in the last year, we looked into all these steps and we yeah, made a proposal, um, yeah, what is possible, what's not, and what are roughly the costs. And so in February this year, after uh, a discussion in the board, we agreed that we would continue to investigate um, and look into this new journal to try and create it. Um, just so everything looks very similar as to with the transactions. So use hot crap for the submission and reviewing software. Um, the editing, for now then, we would still do similar to the transactions, but we will, work, we will form a committee and look how we can automate this as much as possible, such that also the transactions can benefit from this. And um, it was decided to do the hosting step ourselves, such that the ICR is in control, fully in control over their own publications. So, of course, this is just a proposal. And then, of course, the goal is to pre present this full proposal when it is there, hopefully by the end of this year, or maybe early next year, and then um, present this to the membership, that is you, but also uh, much wider, of course, um, to all the ICR members, and I'll have a vote on it if we think that it's a good idea to have this new journal or not. So I really would like to stress, of course, that once we do this, we would like that as many people as possible actually vote on this. So. We will make some noise and try to make some more, uh, yeah, uh, advertisement for it when the time is there. So then don't read all of this. Hopefully these slides will come on the RWC website and you can, can read this in more detail. But I would have two slides with, with an FAQ questions. Many people, when I discussed it also here in the, in, in the breakout room, have asked me, um, and I already would like to answer it here such that we have more time for a useful discussion. So of course, many people ask, so what is the impact on? And then of course, um, our, our main venues, uh, the transactions or, and a very good question on other crypto venues, which are not necessarily uh, ICR organized venues. So let me briefly answer them. So your Crypt Asia, Crypt and Crypto 
we really see this new journal as an additional uh, venue, which tries to decouple going to a conference and presenting your work there uh, and publishing. So when you go to uh, chess or, uh, or any of our uh, conferences, the goal is also to talk to people, to network. Um, so this new journal will not take anything away from this. Um, so, of course, as you, as you saw, the, this new, the, how we set this new journal up is very close to the transactions. Um, so how will this impact the transactions? We really believe that uh, the transactions, so TCHESS and TOSCS, will be the number one venues uh, for CHESS and for FSE. Um, there might, of course, be CHESS-related papers submitted to this new journal or FSE-related papers submitted to this new journal. But the number one uh, venue would still be the transactions. And when we actually believe that it, or it was perceived that the impact on the smaller conferences uh, on the border of the ICR, so the in, in cooperation with, uh, the impact there is much more severe. So think about SEC, Africa Crypt, IndoCrypt, Latin Crypt. Um, if such a new journal would be there, it might actually take away submissions to these conferences, um, which would be bad. And of course, we want to minimize a negative impact uh, on the crypto community as a whole. So we had a conversation with many of the people behind these conferences and we proposed the idea that they could then organize uh, their conferences and that, that will then get published as a special issue in this new journal. And they actually really like this idea and um, it would also be a way for them to actually get more submissions. Uh, and papers which get in there, of course, would then get uh, presented at these local conferences. Another question which is asked frequently is why not simply move all your area conferences to the transaction model? Um, so I think that is, that is an interesting question by itself. So that was not something this committee was tasked to do. Um, and that is also not something we as the ICR board can just tell these people to do. So um, all our uh, sub-communities have their own steering committees and they have their own autonomy to decide whatever they want to do. Um, so, although they could all move to the transaction model, it would not solve all the problems I outlined a couple slides back, um, because there are simply much more areas in crypto than the four uh, area conferences we have. For instance, if you have work which is very practical, it relates to real-world crypto, to which uh, area conference would you submit? So, I think there's a gap and this journal would fill that gap. And then, of course, the question is why not simply change or adapt the Journal of Crypto, because we already have a journal at the ICR. And there, um, yeah, we really believe the Journal of Crypto is intended for the highest quality, the best papers we have. Um, and that is not the goal of this uh, new journal. The, the goal of this new journal is really to ensure that we as a community, it, we allow uh, to scale in the future, have many papers, um, and also for people who actually do not want to travel and present their work, provide them with an alternative outlet um, yeah, to, to publish uh, their work in a journal. If you have any comments, you can always reach the committee at newjournal at icr.org. Maybe before we start off a discussion uh, about the new journal or about publication in general, I would be very curious to see how many people think it's a good idea to have this new journal, so maybe we can do just an informal raise of hands. So who would be informal of, uh, in favor of the new journal? All right, and who would be against? Nobody, okay. That's can, can you comment, Joppe, because people... Yeah, so say. in favor was, uh, I would say, 60-70% of the room, and against was nobody. Uh, so I guess the other 30% uh, is indifferent, they don't know yet, which is perfectly fair. Or they are asleep, yes. <laughs> Good, then let's open up. Yeah, come to the mic if you have an opinion on this. Um, so I'm not the only one answering your questions. We have other people here in the room who were actually uh, yeah, the original authors of this proposal, so they can answer definitely questions as well. So indeed, this is a discussion. Um, so again, questions about the new journal, your opinion, if you think this is a good idea, a bad idea. Um, yeah, Helena? <laughs> okay, I will read a question in Zulip from Dan Bernstein. 
if authors will still be submitting the papers that they think are good to EuroCrypt Asia Crypt and Crypto, then how will the stated problems for the authors and reviewers be addressed by the existence of another journal for the papers that authors don't think are good? I've seen, hang on, let me scroll. <laughs> I've seen this question asked a few times before and have not seen an answer. So I'm not sure if I get the question. The question is, if people still submit their papers to the, our main conferences, uh, how would we solve then yeah, the, the perceived problem? So I guess... Um, maybe put differently, are there no changes to these three conferences? Because no. I think that's the basic problem, right? So I don't know if that's the basic problem, but the, to answer your question, no, we will, so the, we will not change anything to our, our main conferences. We will not change anything to our area conferences. This is about adding another publication outlet. So we would change nothing there. And maybe to, to answer then, so if I understood this question correctly, so how it would solve things, in, in my opinion, is to, since more, it takes some papers out of the queue for your crypt, Asia Crypt and Crypto, um, and hopefully uh, that would then release the stress a bit, uh, the reviewing stress on the PCs there. So it would solve some of the problems we see at your crypt, Asia Crypt and Crypto today? Hope, is, hopefully, is yes. Of course, only time will tell. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if I am um, keeping my good papers for Eurocrypt and whatever, does that mean this journal will have a particularly low impact and uh, be somewhere where if you're an academic, you actually wouldn't want to publish because then you need to publish 10 times as much. I see Nigel would like to answer. Okay, to clarify that. Okay, so um, a number of people in the community can't travel to crypto, your crypto and Asia crypto or travel at all. We have a large number of people who can't travel because of visas. We have a large number of people who can't travel because they're looking after kids. We have a large number of people who are looking after old people. So there's a large group of people who don't want to travel. At the last physical real world crypto, I think it was the last physical, I've lost track of two years, there was a large group of very young members at real world crypto who wanted to actually get rid of all the traveling to publish papers because they don't want to travel because they are against traveling for the climate. We have, um, if you're a European researcher getting funded by Europe now, you have to uh, pay or open access, whether it's with Springer, plus pay to go to the conference, plus pay to travel. So these, you know, traveling and expenses, this is killing a large number of people traveling. So a lot of people will not want to travel to go to conferences. And it was, we now have far more people in the, in the community than we had before. If we scaled crypto and Eurocrypt and Asia crypt to the scale of the current uh, size of the community, we would have five or six tracks which is possible, but it puts the price up. Have you seen the price of CCS? It's like mad, yeah? So, <laughs> it will not, so the whole point of this is this scales. So if people want to, pub, want to go to crypto, your crypt, fine. Quite frankly, I don't want to go anymore. <laughs> I've, I've been to Santa Barbara enough. Um, and I prefer a conference where we, sol we curate the talks rather than just there's some academic who can piss the furthest to get their paper published. Um, so the idea is, is that the papers, it won't necessarily take the worst papers. There still will be a standard. So it still will be, you know, are you saying, I'm oh, sorry, not you. So if you say a paper is not a crypto in your crypt, does that mean it's shit? I don't think so, because that would like be bad for PKC papers or SAC papers or CTRSA papers. So this, there will be, there's a level, People, you don't have to compete with others. You don't have to sit as a PhD student waiting for two years for one paper to be published because all the referees say it's accepted. It's acceptable, but it's not as nice or cool, as trendy as all the other ones are accepted. So it's just basically to take stuff out of the queue. So I wouldn't say anything about the standard. The standard is basically set by the community. It might turn out that people think this journal's better than Crypto Eurocrypt in the end. But that's not for us to decide. That's for the community to decide where people are citing. It's another outlet that's different and allows, is more inclusive, allows other things. And for example, allows real world crypto papers or blockchain papers or what's the other thing I'm not, steganography papers. What's the other thing I'm not allowed to say? QK, no. <laughs> So 
So maybe still on that topic. So what I'm wondering a bit, um, if we say we want this to be orthogonal from publishing at uh, say Eurocrypt and so on, wouldn't that also mean that we should allow to have papers that are accepted in a journal to still publish them at Eurocrypt and then maybe also set a certain amount of places in Eurocrypt where they say we will take this many papers from the journal to encourage publishing there which for Eurocrypt I would imagine would have the advantage that those papers have already been peer-reviewed so the committee could probably just limit themselves to considering is this impressive enough but they wouldn't have to worry about is this correct and I feel this would solve some of the issues that people uh, here keep complaining about. Yeah, so that is definitely an interesting thought and that comes much closer, I don't know if people here remember, of a proposal by Nigel and others from, from, from 2011, which is more or less what you're describing now. Um, and that never made it. So there was quite some uh, support, but also quite some pushback from the community. So that, yeah, never made it. And so that is not this new journal. This new journal will not change anything about crypto, Asia Crypt and Eurocrypt. Um, papers who appear there will not appear at the new journal because then it has already been published somewhere else and vice versa. A paper in the new journal uh, will not be presented or published at any other ICR venue. So some people also write code when they do crypto research <laughs> and that has traditionally not very Paper is not very friendly to, to code, as a lot of people know. Uh, so has uh, artifact evaluation been considered in this context? Yeah, that's, I think that's actually a very good point. So yeah, as you might note, in, for TCHS, there are artifact submissions and they're being reviewed. Um, I also strongly support this. Um, we have not discussed this as part of the new journal, but I think that is actually a very good remark, which we should, should do. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So in the opposite direction to what the gentleman in front of said, instead of elevating, uh, would it for reviewers be an option when something is submitted to one of the main conferences to say, not here, but it is a good paper, we send it on to the other journal automatically? That's interesting. <laughs> because it would prevent it to be rejected and then resubmitted and re-evaluated because it's already evaluated. It's seen as good. It's not seen as top 10%. Why not immediately create that funnel? Yeah, I think if we could manage to do this, <laughs> it would be very interesting. But of course, in practice, because there will be yeah, there is, let's say, for the main conference, there's a PC, and there will be an editorial board for the new journal, which are probably disjoint. So I think in practice, this would be very, very difficult. But uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's something we will definitely take up, yeah. So it seems here that we have a very vast majority in favor of uh, this proposal. Uh, Two weeks ago, I was at FSC and we had a similar session and there was a very strong majority against this proposal. So how comes that we have a divide in this community? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. So I think so we had similar sessions. Yes. So there was a strong majority against and here there is strong majority in favor of exactly. the outcomes. So, so, so maybe to, to, to summarize indeed, so at the, at the FSC, the, um, yeah, this new journal was discussed without, unfortunately, uh, any member of this new journal committee involved. Um, and there, indeed, there was a vast majority against creating this. Um, the question, yeah, why is, are the opinions so, so different? Um, I think one, um, most importantly, there's a lack of, which is definitely to blame on us, with, on trying to communicate with FSE because the strongest objections are coming from the FSE community. I think their biggest fear is, is um, also what they wrote, they believe that this might pose a threat to their transactions, so that more people will submit to this journal and it would harm their community or their, so TOSC, their transactions. So I do
do not believe this. I think FSE and Chess are both very strong venues by itself. Uh, the transactions are really well established. I think it's a big success. Um, so I do not think this new journal will pose a threat to that. But yeah, time will tell because, like I said, I think we should try to minimize, the, of course, a negative impact on our communities. That's including Chess, including FSE. Um, so yeah, why were people there much more negative? I think. We, so we started talking to, to that com community. I was hoping there were more people from that community here so that they could voice uh, their concerns and we could discuss it. Uh, but we will definitely redo this exercise also uh, yeah, at Eurocrypt, uh, end of May, to, to hopefully people are then present there. We, and then yeah, we can discover uh, yeah, why they are uh, so against this. Right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm looking at Sulip, so I'm just trying to voice what's being, what's going on there. It's not questions, it's comments. Um, so a comment from, I believe, Thomas Porno on Dan Bernstein's earlier question. I personally don't think that the papers I push to ePrint are not good. I nowadays tend to avoid the usual formal publication process because it is a source of delays and administrative frustration. I also like to be able to go beyond the usual page limit if the new journal happens, I will submit there and probably only there. That's his comment. Um, and Very then, nice, yeah. And then the second comment here from Kevin McCurley. I'm on the committee and I was an advocate for expanding the scope to reconsider the strategy of all IACR publications. For 20 years, we've been hampered in our movement toward open access, uh, but we used ePrint to skirt this issue. I still think ICR's publication plan is too fragmented. Okay. Yeah, so that is a question maybe we can, so that's a different question. Um, what I said in the beginning, so what do we think should the ICR do in the long run? So f let's now forget about the new journal. Where do we see ourselves in 10 years, 15 years? Do we want to still be with Springer for lots of our uh, publication? Do we want to do everything ourselves or s something else? I think that is something we should all think about. We don't have to answer that now. It would be great if we could answer this now, but uh, in the, yeah, I agree. It's a, a good question, but a difficult question. Yeah. So maybe the queue, yeah. I want to come back to um, the sub-communities. I think you said that uh, the associated conferences, Latin Crypt, uh, uh, SAC, et cetera, could want to use the journal for making special issues. So, yes, yeah, so, yeah, we spoke to all of them. Some were okay with it, they thought it was a great idea, and some indeed it said um, that they think it would really benefit uh, their community. And have you thought of how this is going to work in practice? Um, are you going to just, uh, whatever is accepted at the conferences goes in the journal and there is a special committee, how do you do quality control, for example, to, to be sure that the quality of what comes from these uh, special issues is in line with the quality expected from the journal? So that's a good question. So no, we have not uh, worked out all these details because yeah, we haven't even decided yet if this new journal would yeah would be there. But that is indeed something we would need to work out with the uh, yeah with the, the steering committees or the people behind these journals uh, behind these uh, conferences. Well, regardless of whether we are getting this new journal or not the fundamental problem is not solved. So the papers will come back to us to be reviewed. So the load is the same as long as the good papers get accepted. No, because that, that, that's the whole point. So papers which are now submitted to the new journal, if they're good, they, they get in. So they get then reviewed once, maybe of course with an iteration. Um, if they are bad, they get rejected. Um, and then they are not allowed to, to, to resubmit. Um, mm -hmm. While for yeah, the main conferences, you do this whole circus when you resubmit and resubmit, and there are new PCs for your crypt, Asia Crypt Crypto. So then it's a lot of work which is being redone because reviews are not shared between the PCs. Mm -hmm. But then why don't we just accept the papers and have some kind of indication of what Nigel pointed out before, like whether the authors want to travel or not, and then just select the best papers or have the PC decide what is the catchy topic for the conference and still have the good papers. I mean, we know that papers get rejected from these venues with three accepts, so. 
So, that yeah. is the fundamental problem. So why don't we solve the fundamental problem, regardless of whether we need another journal or not? Yeah, so I, I do believe that this approach has lots of benefits. This comes back to the, to the question we just answered. This is more or less the proposal from 2011, um, which we failed to, 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 to materialize at that point. Um, but yeah, I still do think that the new journal would uh, solve the problems raised, but indeed we can solve it in, in many different ways. What you're saying would solve it as well. Um, but that, 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 that was not now the, the, the question or the proposal raised by the community. So that we are investigating that proposal. But maybe Nigel, do you want to say something? Please use the, the mic. Politics. It's easier to do something new than change art. Something that, because people are invested in something in the past, so they don't want to change your crypto. Oh, sorry? Oh, I have to do this right. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> okay. The, I have to look at you. And, uh, um, people are invested in something that already exists. So changing something that already exists is really, really hard. We tried this in 2011. doesn't work. So doing something new, there's no vested interest. So it's kind of, it's more likely to succeed. It's just, it's just, it's people are the problem. Okay, I got one question here. I think I was first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way you can take over. Um, okay, from Imad Heydari Beni. There is a similar effort in the systems community, and he gives a, a reference link. They published the reviews as well. Is there any plan to do the same thing? Uh, published reviews can potentially reduce the review load if papers get rejected. Yes, so we, of course, spoke yeah, because we've been looking at this for now over a year and we spoke to neighboring communities. So Pets, for instance, is exactly, we had a discussion with them, uh, I think two weeks ago, they're doing exactly the same thing. They're trying to move away and want to create their own uh, journal um, and wanted to learn from the ICR, our findings. Um, there are other communities, especially for instance, in machine learning where they have much more massive Conferences uh, allows for scalability. They have indeed open reviews. Um, so we considered this, but uh, we decided for now at least, for the short term, that's not the path we wanna, wanna take. We can always change uh, our strat strategy, right? If we grow or if the community decides we want open reviews, we can always do it. But, but for now, let's stick to what we already have. And yeah, let's not try to change too many things at the same, t uh, at the same time. Ben. I've got um, two comments and one question. Uh, the first, there's a lot of insistence that nothing will change for crypto, WagerCrypt and EuroCrypt, uh, which is a shame. Um, uh, anything that makes the conferences more interesting, more interactive, more environmentally friendly will be good. Um, second is uh, regional conferences, anything that can help them, I think is, is a good thing because they're more accessible. They sort of build a local community. Uh, while you're waiting for the new journal, there'll be a sack call for papers in the very near future and you should send all your good papers there. Uh, and the question, I guess, is we talk about the conferences and we talk about the, like the, the specialist journals, but the, the thing that, that I wasn't quite clear for me is um, uh, everyone here, uh, will tell you that they write excellent papers. Um, how are they supposed to know whether their excellent paper is meant for Journal of Cryptology or Journal of, of this one? Um, that, that's just a distinction that wasn't really clear in the presentation for me. Yeah, so I think that ties in what Nigel was saying. So it, it is not clear, right? Uh, it is all your personal perception. Some people think FSE uh, for their paper is the best, uh, the highest tier uh, venue. Other, other people would think crypto is the highest tier venue. Other people think, no, you should go outside our community to use Nix or CCS. It's, it's all, uh, yeah, it's your own personal perception and your choice where you submit your paper. I just mean, if I've got a great paper and I think it's in the middle of this community, it's for everyone. It's pretty good. None of us write terrible stuff. <laughs> do we? Uh, then, yeah, how do I know if it's a this paper or it's a that paper? They're both supposed to be good journals. They're both from the, the same place. They've both got reasonable turnaround. Uh, so I would say if you think if it's a generic crypto paper, if you think it's the best of the best, you should probably submit to Journal of Crypto. 
If you have an area topic like FSE or chess, you should definitely go for the transactions. They are really the best in their area. If you have a paper about blockchain or any other thing which is not covered by the, the main area, uh, the, the area conferences, you can either submit to this new journal, depends if you want to travel or not. If you really want to present your work, you can submit it to our, uh, yeah, to Crypto Asia Crypt, your crypt. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so just on the idea to uh, publish here papers that got three accepts in other conferences but didn't get because of quota, uh, I think it's a very good way of... Sorry, you can't hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I think, yeah, that would really solve the problems of re-reviewing papers, but I think there is still a concern because, uh, like uh, Nigel said, the success of this paper will depend on how the community views it afterwards. And so uh, then... Like, how do you know when you see someone published there? Was it published in this journal because it wasn't good enough for uh, these other conferences or because the author didn't want to travel or anything? So just to make sure not to damage the, the reputation of the paper in that way, if you just get everyone from the bigger conferences. Yeah, so only time will, I guess only time will tell there, right? So, I mean, there are multiple outcomes how this can go. It could be that only the, the lowest quality papers will get submitted to such a new journal and then indeed it might just collapse and might not be a success. It might be that it gets submissions from yeah from all kinds of levels. So it has uh, on the same tier as a chess, as a PKC, as a TCC, as a Eurocrypt, uh, Asiacrypt. But it comes from people who do not have the funds, for instance, to present their work mm -hmm. and, and travel to that conference. So I think that is our goal to try and solve that problem, but only time will tell how it will turn out. Yeah. So my point picks up on the previous two points. So I think um, it's kind of like not good enough for it to depend on how it's going to turn out. Like consider that you're like a PhD student now and you think you have a good paper and you know you and your co-authors think that, so, so that's fine. So you want to submit to the best place it can be. And especially if like later down the line, you're gonna to apply to a postdoc and it, the, the wording of that job adverts is always, you need top tier publications. So if we don't know how this journal is going to turn out, then as an early career researcher, you're not going to want to risk publishing here for it to turn out to be a low quality venue. So we need to kind of maybe agree as a community that it will be a good quality venue <laughs> and just like make, rather than be like, oh, we're fine if it doesn't turn out well, because then you're not going to solve the problem of everyone wants to publish it, like you're a crypt crypto, whatever, because these are the ones that are seen as the best venues. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I, also, I fully agree. And I think, of course, this journal was not created, or we are not creating it by saying this will be a very low tier uh, venue. That is, that is not the goal, indeed. Yeah. So, I, indeed, if we can here now agree as a community that it will be a, a solid <laughs> tier venue, I, I, I fully support. Yeah. Hey. Um, so, I often hear from other uh, young researchers in the field that they unfortunately have uh, bad review experiences. Uh, I think many people have had this, so you get like, uh, I think it's a good paper, and reviewer one and three are very positive, and reviewer two hates it, uh, <laughs> and it gets rejected, and then some other conferences accept it uh, without any problems. Uh, and I think this even happens between your crypto and crypto in, in either direction. Um, you mentioned uh, just now that your your yeah the plan is okay. You can submit to this journal, and then you have two rounds, and then if it's rejected, it's it's out forever. How would you avoid uh, these like negative reviewer experiences that people have had in the past? Um, have you thought about implementing measures like this interactive rebuttal that we've now seen a few times? Are there can you say something about how we uh, avoid these kinds of yeah, recurring things uh, appearing and this just being a fourth venue that you can uh, get unfairly rejected from. Thank yeah, you. I think that's a, that's a, it's a very good point. And this, of course, was in the original proposal, described in detail already some ideas and plans how to exactly deal with this. So indeed, we should try and learn from all the good things and mechanisms we have in our community to deal with this. So indeed, a rebuttal is one. So that would definitely, uh, just as we have for the transactions, uh, be part of it. Um, and yeah, just as we see with a lot of other conferences, you have two accept and one reject. Yeah, you're out. And here for the new journal, then the question would be, if you have two accept and one reject, so why is that the case? So then, indeed, we need to have a mechanism 
in place to, to investigate why is there one clear reject? Uh, does he know more or did he discover a flaw or is he simply wrong? Um, but how we're going to deal with this exactly in practice, that would be uh, one of the many things we still need to figure out after we decide if we want to create this new journal or not. But uh, yeah, I fully agree with your point. Thank you. Okay, my turn. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to say, I, I don't think I can ask many more questions here, but just to say afterwards you can go and check out the Zulip online because now there's kind of a discussion going on here too. So I'm not going to read everything <laughs> and we'll just continue in the room and then please go check online uh, because, yeah, there's very active discussion going on now. Yes, yeah, so already I, uh, I want to apologize for the folks in Zulip because we get the concert afterwards. So I will not reply to all the chat messages immediately, but I, I will try and have a look this evening. So, uh, next question. Um, yeah, so, sorry, because I'm going to get back to like a couple of questions that were already asked. So, it was like uh, by Dan staying on the chat and by Eleftheria here. Um, so, I get the idea of this new journal and all the kind of politics problem that were pointed out by Nigel. Uh, but is there anything stopping us from also trying to like bring back the 2011 proposal? Because it's been 11 years, right? We, it might work this time. Yeah, so I mean, nothing is preventing us from bringing it back, of course. So that is, it's simply not the task we were asked to investigate right now. I know, I know. But it's, it's, I fully agree. It, uh, if uh, the majority of our community is behind this, then we should just do it. Uh, yeah, and we should investigate if it's feasible. So, so yeah, I think nothing is stopping uh, us from investigating. Um, what's the formal procedure to do this? send an email to the board to me or any other people on the board for instance the president is of course also um, the first uh, person send him an email that you support investigating this and then it will be discussed at a board meeting and we decide if uh, i guess we will then uh, ha have a look but or talk there are many board members here present as well uh, come to us uh, you can just tell us and then we take note and we will take action Okay, like thanks, because I think it keeps coming back, right? Like, I think yeah, yeah, I think yeah. It's the same in 2011, there was strong support. When I talk to people, I always have the opinion that there is strong support for this. But yeah, it failed in 2011 because there was also a very strong opposition. People don't like change, uh, or some parts of our community. But maybe Nigel, you can clarify. Okay, so it's really difficult because you've got lots of vested interests. However, one solution, one. Possibly, don't tell anybody, there's not many people here, are there? Okay, but one way of getting to the 2011 proposal is to have the new journal and then put your Cryptasia Krypton uh, out, out of business. <laughs> but uh, let me reiterate, that is not our goal. <laughs> so although it might be Nigel's goal, that, that will not happen. <laughs> we will ensure, of course, that will not, uh, not be the case. I have one specific thing I want to comment on, and I'm actually surprised nobody else brought it up. So I don't believe in pay to publish. I've never paid to publish in a journal. I think it creates a perverse incentive because you'd be encouraged to accept more papers but this is just not, to get but more money. Let's because be, it was a hundred dollars. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that. So, so I so don't think that this hundred dollars is going to go to the PhD student who's spending no, 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 an me, hour of their time to. Yeah, let me, and, and then Brian can clarify. So maybe I, I, it was not clear. We will not do pay to, uh, to publish. That's at least not the current proposal. So can you show this? Yeah, this so I, it says it costs $100 it would to be, publish. It would be the cost for the ICR. Yeah. It would not be the cost for the person uh, submitting or accepting the paper. Brian, please go ahead. Yeah, let me address this. I am not a member of the committee, but as treasurer of the ICR, of course, it ultimately falls to me to figure out a viable funding model working with folks for that. So the slide that Yape had was showing what the cost would be to the IACR to what the goal was to publish, right? There's a cost that the IACR pays for all of our publications and our transactions. They get, those publications get funded out of the revenues of the IACR. Your membership fees go to pay for some of that. Any, you know, funds that come in over the cost of running conferences, et cetera. What is envisioned is that if this new journal proposal is approved, that part and parcel of that proposal will be a funding model for the IACR's general funds to pay for that. Now, 
as you all know, if you've heard me, if you've stayed around for a membership meeting at Your Crypt Crypto or Asia Crypt, and you know that I have to make a recommendation every year on fees, it is possible that part of the funding model for this might include slightly increasing the $50 membership dues every year, and that some of that might help to pay for this if it turns out that's a way to do it. Another possible funding model would be to solicit sponsorships for this sort of event, and we can actually go look at, God help me, advertising, um, but you know, <laughs> uh, but, but sponsorship for, for that, or it gets paid out of, you know, investment gains, right? There's a lot of different models we have for how we cover the expenses of the organization. What no one wants to do is say it's a pay to play model yeah. and that you would have to pay some, some page charge or submission charge for that, right? I strongly believe if this goes through, it is an activity of the IACR and it gets funded just like we fund schools, just like we fund fellows, just like everything else out of the operations of the IACR. And we budget for that, and that's, that's the answer. So, yeah, so it would work really the same now for Journal of Crypto. There is a cost for every paper appearing there as well, uh, which of course sure, is... I, I do think you may want to update your slide, because it does seem to say that we need to pay to publish. That, so. is, that is a very good point. I will make that much, much clearer. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to get back to sort of the impact factor discussion, and uh, maybe ask the room what they think the impact factor of ICR ePrint is. Cause yeah, that's how I usually get to papers. I look something up on ICR ePrint and then I, oh, it happens to be published in X or Y or Z. Um, it's up to the editors to make sure that they accept good papers and then the rest will follow. But I think that a lot of people don't discover papers based on the impact factor of stuff. So I don't really understand the, the problem. <laughs> Yeah, I can say something. So somebody want to react? I think discovering papers on ePrint, I think that is very good. That is a nice part of our community, such that people can get free access to papers. But related to impact facts and other things, for lots of academics, so in, I'm from industry, and in industry, I mean, I don't care if my paper is in a journal or wherever, but for lots of people who want an academic job, it needs to be published at a, at a good journal indeed. So then just having your paper on ePrint is, is not sufficient. Yeah, that, that is true. Maybe we should also form a committee for those things. <laughs> I think we heard the concern uh, that, that this is con going to be considered as, I don't know, a place where people want to publish it to, especially from young researchers. And so I think that the, the more senior researchers maybe have, or it would be nice if they would voluntarily commit to, to submit to that, such that others also have an incentive to that. Because right now I don't see any uh, incentive other than being idealistic and just political. And so I was one of the uh, people from the group from uh, RWC 2020 who were discussing that stuff. And I think it's super important. And right now, I think everyone who is a young researcher want to stay in academia, there is actually very little incentive to publish to their paper. Although I really want to have something like that and these changes, um, like the 2011 proposal, I think this is what would change something to let people uh, publish to that thing. So I think reiterating that thing and also maybe when senior researchers talk about that and try to come up with ideas voluntarily committing to uh, sub submit to it or something like that would be, I think, very important for the success of that thing. Yeah, I fully agree. And we already discussed that within the committee that, of course, for the first couple of issues, we need to ensure indeed that, that senior uh, members of the community uh, submit some papers there uh, or invite them to submit some papers there such that indeed there's an incentive for the others uh, yeah, to, to turn to this journal. I fully agree. Okay, we're starting to run out of time a little bit. General Check came in saying, you know, guys, we need to start drinking here pretty soon. I saw the conductor also come in to check on us, so yeah. One last question? Yeah, well, the final question. Oh, well, I'm afraid it'll be a comment, but... Great. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, a small incentive, also as an early stage researcher, to publish in this potential journal. Um, I expect the quality of the reviews will be possibly order of magnitudes higher. And I say from personal experience that 
the reviews that I do for journals tend to be longer and more thought out because I don't have so many to do at the same time. And so one of the things that's been mentioned is uh, it's frustrating as a PhD student to sort of be thrown into this, I don't know, the Satan pit of reviewing and not knowing like whether your paper is good or not and some reviewers thinking it is and isn't. Well, I think you get far more considered reviews when you have a journal submission process. And so, I don't know, I think, I think this would benefit uh, young researchers very much indeed. So. All right, thanks a lot. Let's continue the discussion over some, uh, some drinks with a concert. Uh, yep. I, I look forward to, to continue this. Thank you, Jope and everybody. <laughs>